Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. We're sponsored this week by EcoWare, where you can find new designs every week where we carbon offset the production, shipping, and life cycle of every product, and we plant a tree for every order. So it's carbon negative. And we're brought to you by abetterrootplanner.com. Get a 30-day free trial of their new premium version of their app. Use the link in the description in the show notes below. And we're sponsored by our friends at the Solar Powered Hotels in Schaumburg, Illinois, the Fairfield Inn and Suites by Marriott, and the Town Place Suite Hotel right next door. They're both connected, they're both solar powered, and they both have EV charging. So Jesse, I'm really excited about this week's episode because we interviewed Michael Olea, who is the CEO and co-founder of Dexter, which is a new school, a new way of educating kids. And I just want to get right into it. Hey, everybody. I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you are watching. I don't even know what we call these. These are, I guess, just our interviews. This but... is an interview podcasty kind of thing. Uh, we're going to be talking today with Michael from uh, the company called Dexter. And uh, I have learned very little about this company. So I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be your uh, your person who doesn't know anything about it because everyone watching this is pretty much going to be where I am. You've had a little bit more in-depth understanding of what Dexter is and what they do. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to Michael today because um, I learned about Michael and Dexter a couple of years ago when he was pitching uh, his company to an incubator. Um, this is basically a bunch of startups that are trying to get funding. Um, and I was one of the angel investors on the call watching. And basically, they had three minutes, each of these companies, to tell you what they were all about. And uh, when I got to Michael's company, Dexter, after three minutes, I invested. Okay, Michael. <laughs> three minutes. Three minutes, go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, the, uh, the life of an entrepreneur having to give uh, elevator pitches and what have you. Um, but no, super, super excited to be here uh, to kind of share what, what Dexter is all about. Uh, we started in 2017, and um, really Dexter is an entirely new type of school. And we're really rethinking you know, what students learn, how they learn, where they learn. And uh, fundamentally, though, what we're all about is just bringing really transformational education experiences to students. And I think that's ultimately the, the reason we exist, why most schools should exist, is because it should be about transforming humans. You know, a lot of these really powerful ideas and mental models, they don't just naturally happen like language acquisition. You have to be very intentional about transforming the minds of humans. Um, and we kind of think of it maybe in computer science terms, it's about upgrading the operating system of mankind, of humankind. And we think that if we can do that, if we can upgrade the OS of humankind, uh, and of course, you know, with Neuralink and brain machine interfaces, that's a whole other conversation. Um, but we really think that this is what we need to do. It's kind of a race against the clock. We need to upgrade the OS because in many cases, it's like if you tried to run you know, a new modern day program on Windows 98, it just wouldn't compute, it just wouldn't work. And so if you wanna solve climate change, for instance, that will not work on our kind of old tribal mindset. We need a new operating system. And so that's really why Dexter exists. Wow, okay. See, this is, okay, because Jesse's been asking me like, right. why are you so excited about Dexter? And, and I was like, I, uh, okay, so it's like <laughs> school, but not, it's different. Yeah. I, okay. I, so I, I definitely want to talk about what you just brought up because that is a lot to unpack. I know that I don't know anything about how your school functions yet, but I love what you just said. So just as like a little aside, like when I went to school, I, I hated it. It was just like I would go to school. The biggest question in my mind all day was like, why? Why am I learning this? Why are we doing this? Why do I have to do that? Why can't I turn this in late? You know, why aren't, you know, why, 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 why? And I hated it, didn't want to go. It was the biggest stressor in my life. The moment I graduated from college, I was just like. <sighs> <sighs> and the thing was, uh, I felt cheated because no one had told me that you'd be done at some point. Like, I don't know why, like, I don't, like, clearly the, Clearly, the information is out there that, like, you will be done with school at some point. Um, but to me, and I don't know if it was just because I the concept just didn't stick in my head. I just didn't think that it would ever end. And it, when it ended, I was just so happy and have been happy ever since, practically. I've just been like, oh, my gosh. So hearing you talk about a school that is not just like, well, you are going to learn because you you have to learn. That sounds amazing. Let's get back on track. Let's. I want to learn about how you're trying to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I was very much in the same boat. Um, you know, I, I hated school so much. I went to public schools in Texas. Uh, I hated school so much I graduated a year early from high school. Um, and I was very much the, the kid that was reading my own books. Uh, I was just 
teaching myself because the answers that I was looking for, I wasn't finding in school. Uh, it found like it was very devoid of meaning. Um, actually, I actually think there's probably a consequence you know, of us throwing the baby out with the bath, bath water with religion, where we kind of threw out these mythic ideals and ideas about the hero's journey. You know, we very rightfully so, we became this kind of very uh, technical, logical society. And we lost some of those ancient stories around meaning. And luckily, I was this really weird kid that was very conscious of my mortality. And that really freaked me out. You know, I kind of had this existential terror. And I think that's very healthy for, for, for young people, uh, really humans in general, to kind of contemplate their own mortality. And if you do that long enough, you start seeking answers. And it turns out I was not finding the answers in school. Um, precisely that question that you raised, which is like, what is the meaning of this? Why am I here? Uh, and we, we're very kind of upfront about this. We call it the mythic model of education. The reason you're in school is to learn how to read, to write, to think mathematically. But the reason you're doing that is because it's your, your shield of armor. If you can do that, if you can realize yourself as an individual, you can go out and slay dragons. You can solve real problems. You can build electric vehicles. You, as an individual, have agency. You can stand up as a majority of one, and you can call BS because you're powerful. You know that stupid poster we all remember, knowledge is power? It's real, it's actually true. And that's the crazy thing that they don't tell you about. Like, hey, the reason we're doing this is not so you pass a test or get to college. The reason we're doing this is because fundamentally we live in this network society made up of individuals. And you as an individual, the whole world hinges on who you become. And if you can become a person that's articulate, that thinks in terms of evidence, logic, that can think mathematically, that can build, that can create, there's no limits to what you can do. And People are not telling kids this. They're not conceptualizing kids as this hero's journey of, of self-actualization. You know, we're talking a lot about rights, but not responsibilities. And whenever you tell a young kid, hey, your life has meaning, you have the responsibility, especially here in the United States, we're kind of like the control center of the universe. If you're in the US, you've won the ovarian lottery. That comes with a pretty large responsibility. If you're in the US and you're a kid, you have a responsibility to, the, to humankind, to the future, to you know, get your shield of armor, get your sword, prepare yourself, and ultimately go out to battle and solve real problems. And I found, I'm kind of an absurdist philosopher essentially, where I found that the meaning in life, you have to create it. And I think that my meaning has been around making reality better. Because there's an ancient tradition, and this is a very wise, I think, point of view to start with. Uh, I think every, every, every person should probably go through a thermodynamics class and really understand entropy. But fundamentally what that says is that the world is chaotic, reality is suffering, it's always been on fire, pain and suffering are horrible, and it's our job as enlightened animals to reduce pain and suffering to the extent possible. And that's really what Dexter's all about, is preparing this new generation of scientists, artists, engineers, giving them the raw materials, the intellectual capital to go out in the world and to build, to create. And again, when you tell a kid that, it changes their whole conception. They start thinking of themselves as a hero in their own movie. And they start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in a movie right now. I'm in a video game. And you have a choice. Do you want to be the, you know, the, the non-player character? Or do you want to be the hero? It, and, it, and what that does is it creates an orientation. Uh, one of my favorite scientists, Richard Hamming, he talked about, you know, in your career, you need an orientation. You need the North Star. He tells this fantastic story of a, a drunken sailor in the bar where the sailor stumbles around the bar and the distance traveled is the square root of the number of steps he takes. So he might take 100 steps, but he's only going to travel 10 steps. But he, someone walks in who he's attracted to. And he, now he's stumbling around, but now and he, but he's headed towards that attractor. And so now the distance traveled is proportional to the number of steps he takes. And so the point is that you need an orientation. You need a northern star. And in some sense, I think that's what we've lost as a society, as a community, as a country, is a northern star. And you know, we see these exceptional humans like Elon Musk, he has a northern star. What if we all collectively had that northern star? You know, and so, you know, with, with Dexter, what we're building in terms of our campuses and our curriculum and the staff, and there's all these tiny technical things that we have to build that are super important. But fundamentally, if you don't have that orientation, it's pointless. And that's, I think that's probably what you were experiencing is like, why am I here? I, oh my God, I'm where gonna, were you, Michael, <laughs> when he was in high school? Oh my God. <laughs> I, Wow. He, he turned out just fine. I, I think, I, but it took a lot. It took a lot. It really did. And uh, and, and no, I mean, everything that you're saying, 
No, but as, as I'm going to I'm going to cry in the middle in this interview. No, I'm I know. sure of it because no. this is like, oh, my God, is this everything that I've been ever thinking about all the time since I have like since my prefrontal lobe has developed enough to the point where I can actually start thinking like this so often in education. I felt like. I was being trained to be a non-player character. Like yes. I was just going to be this like, you know, it, like I didn't feel like I ever had agency as a student. And I think that was one of the biggest things for me. Like, yeah, you just sort of feel like you have to do this because you have to do this. It, fe it felt very Kafka-esque. It felt very uh, Soviet in a way. You just were like, you know, why why are we doing this? Well, and, because you must do it. And, and as a parent, it felt awful because I had to send you to school. I knew you hated it every day. And it pained me as a parent because I wanted to say all the things you're saying, Michael. But I knew deep down that wasn't true. So it was just like kind of like, well, just get through it, son. And that's a horrible thing as a parent right. to have to say to a kid. And it was always confusing to me as well, because like throughout my life, the adults in my life, not necessarily my parents, but the people I uh, saw who were adults were basically they were always envious of me as a child being like, oh, if I could be a kid again. And I was I was always like, really, because it really sucks being a child. Like, I'm a kid. I can't do anything. Um, and then as I became an adult, I was expecting to sort of be like, oh, if I could be a kid again. I love being an adult. This is great. If I want to go, you know, do something, I can just go do it. I don't have to ask permission. I can just get in my car and drive there. Like I have so much agency um, and a, agency that I never had before. And that as I've been growing and learning, I really enjoy having. And no one ever told me that in school that like you would have agency, that you could do things that you wanted to do. It just sort of sounded like, all right, once you get out of here, we're just training you. And then once you get out, uh, you're going to go to a job where you're not going to have much agency. Um, well, what I want to know from Michael is, OK, so you saw that our current system is broken. Right. We talk about that all the time on the show. But how have you been able to figure out a solution? A long process filled with experiments, failures. You know, it's the scientific method. Like, and that's I think that's probably the the, the reason why. You know, these grand experiments from like, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, or these MBAs or these administrators um, kind of whiteboarding solutions out, having this grand idea. Uh, that's not how real systems get built. You know, like you think of the, the roadster, like that process, that engineering mindset of iteration is so profoundly important because there's this massive class of unknown unknowns. Like you just don't know what you don't know. And you know, when we started three years ago, we had, of course, this ambition, the guiding star, we want to build a new education system. But we recognize in many senses, you know, we're sideline quarterbacks. We need to actually get in the game. And so the way we figure it out is by experimentation and slowly improving, you know, being really obsessed with quality and efficacy and evidence. Um, the important thing though is that we didn't start as a school. Um, that's the weird kind of paradox here is that the stakes are so high, you can't start a lot of educational experiments. You know, it'd, it'd be really, I think it'd be very problematic to start a totally experimental school from day one. And so for two and a half years, we were totally a supplemental program, an after school program. And that gave us the intellectual freedom to, in a sandbox, to experiment with new modes of learning, um, to develop our own infrastructure, our own curriculum. And so, you know, it was just a really long, non sexy process of being in the trenches. And that's what, you know, we have this, we have a, you know, I think there's like 16 team members now. We have, last, this last month we had 10,000 students all across the world access our live streams. We have this big, incredible system that we've built, but what you don't see is the years toiling away behind the, the, the lab bench, if you will, in the trenches. Um, and that's kind of the really interesting thing is that there's this massive kind of practicality gap between what the average citizen in the US thinks happens in schools and like what they think how kids learn and what actually is happening. And so you really have to get in the weeds, you have to get in the trenches um, because you know, I had so many assumptions about how a proper school should actually work um, because you watch these TED Talks, you read these books and there's this, this massive gap. And you know, it's like, it's this old saying, like two thieves, they, they cross each other in the street and they know like, oh, hey, like, they recognize each other. Uh, in a similar sense, like real practitioners, you know, I kind of think back to Tesla and like, 
you know, Elon Musk's knowledge base, um, it's real because they had to go through the iteration, the design process, same thing with SpaceX, all these, you know, the explosions. Um, that's part of the process. Failure is part of the process. Being a scientist is part of the process. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think, going back to some of the, the actual core curriculum and the knowledge, uh, what are the powerful ideas? You know, because part of what we need to do is, okay, let's define what it means to be literate. And really with Dexter, we're trying to redefine that. You know, because there is a baseline set of what skills and, and mental models to be literate, you know, 50 years ago. Those are changing now. We need to expand the, defini the definition of literacy. Um, some of those, I think one of the primary areas of a new form of literacy is scientific thinking, to be able to approach things as a scientist. And you look at, you know, like our government bureaucrats or the, the obsession with DC politics, they are not scientists. One of the hallmarks of a scientific mindset is that you change your mind based on evidence. It's enshrined in the very fabric of the domain. Now compare that to politics. It's a pejorative to change your mind. You're a flip-flopper. You know, so the way we built Dexter embodies the, one of the core powerful ideas, which is that we built it through experimentation, being engineers, being scientists. Um, and again, we were lucky to not start as a school, and that's a weird paradox. Sometimes to go after something, you have to go the opposite direction. You know, so we wanted to build a school, but you don't start by building a school if you want to build a school. Just like with Tesla, they wanted to build a mass market electric vehicle. You actually, in practice, have to build a really high cost sports car. In a very similar sense, that's our process, which again is so counterintuitive to, to most humans that the direct path is an indirect path. Okay, so how does your school work? Yeah, so this has been a little bit complicated with COVID, <laughs> as you can imagine, <laughs> yeah, just, just slightly. Um, but we, we describe Dexter as a blended learning school, which means that you can be fully remote. Um, you can you know, work on a computer from any part of the world, and we have students all across the world, um, or you can be on campus. And we started uh, a year ago our full-time school. We started with a really small cohort, 24 students, and then we doubled that, um, and those were on campus. Our, our campus is really incredible. It's a transformational space. You can think of it a little bit more um, like an educational maker space, kind of a, a clubhouse for kids. Um, the key thing for a school, um, and it's going to be weird to kind of talk about how Dexter works. You have to talk about different levels of the stack. Um, I think one of the key things of a school is that you need to have normal access to special things. Um, at least for me, when I was in elementary school, the school was still special because we had a bunch of uh, Apple computers. I didn't have a computer at home at that age that I was using. And so there was still some sense like, oh, I want to go to school. There was this library. There's some, you know, it, was, it gave me access to this kind of transformational equipment. Um, again, that's why I think universities are so profound. Um, you know, like with Coursera and Udacity, those are great. But I don't think a lot of the universities are going anywhere because it provides access to a community um, and to transformational equipment. Um, there's a great book called Unschooling Society that they call it the means of learning. You know, so you have the means of production. But what are the means of learning? We need access to equipment to actually provide that. Um, so our physical spaces are pretty transformational. Um, they don't look like a kind of a traditional school. There's a lot of building taking place. Um, but so say you, you enroll in, in Dexter, the first really important thing is diagnostics. And so we really believe in stage, not age. Um, this is a really problematic thing that happens. A lot of school systems, um, because of the incentive structure, uh, it introduces some kind of perverse notions where um, if you look at a school system, they'll say, we graduate 98% of our students as if that's a good thing. Um, you know, the question is, well, are you graduating 98% of your students that are like, at proficient level? And the answer is no. So what ends up happening is that a lot of kids get pushed through these grade levels um, when they're not prepared. And so we really obsess, like, okay, what is your actual current state across these different domains? Let's make sure you're in the proper course. Because if you don't do that, you get this massive knowledge deficit. Uh, and this compounds over time. It, it's a foundation, right? The foundation of learning. And so as soon as you skip a layer of bricks, you can't just put the next layer of bricks on top of nothing. They don't stay there. And and if you're just going along, if, if you like had a robot that's placing bricks and it had missed an entire row, um, it's just going to, they're, they're not the bricks aren't going to just fall neatly on top of the brick. Like it doesn't just fix itself and you're just a layer behind. The bricks fall off. And now, and now you're just building on top of air and you're not doing anything. And that's, and I've seen this in both myself when I was in school and also lots of my friends. Cause if I'm a person who doesn't like, who maybe needed to have caught up at, at some point, probably third, fourth grade. And there's tons of kids with me who also needed to do that. We're all the kind of the kids sitting in the back of the class. 
And everyone kind of paints us as like, oh, those are the look out for those kids. And it's always just like, you know, I, I was with them. None of them were stupid. Like we weren't dumb. It's not like we we didn't understand some of the topics. Sometimes we would have more interesting conversations at the back of the classroom than were happening at the front of the classroom because we were, you know, talking about Napoleon or whatever in a completely different context. But just because we had been sort of left behind at some stage or we had completely lost interest because we had either missed a, a layer of bricks or, or whatever, we just, yeah, you you kind of get the sense that you're just like, Oh well, I guess we're on this uh, we're on this ride together. This you know this like diorama. I kind of think of uh, what is that thing in the big ball in Epcot? The the geodesic dub. Yeah, yeah. Well, your 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 intuition exactly right, and that that speaks to one of the the core values we have at Dexter is that we should honor the neuroscience and the cognitive science of how students actually learn. And what you're describing is this this deficit that takes place. Um, you know, why is it that we have these predator distributions all around society? Um, why is it that, uh, you know, even, you know, you think about in far back of the Bible, the Matthew principle, to those who have more will be given, to those who don't, more will be taken away. That's what's happening cognitively with intelligence. And so it's very, and, and this is why there's something called the achievement gap, which essentially says schools have no effect on students. It's really just a function of your social background. You come from a wealthy, wealthy background, you're going to be, you're going to be solid. Um, the reason why is precisely what you're talking about. So if you start first grade with a vocabulary gap, if you're not able to read, or if you have, you know, say you have 50% of the vocabulary, well, think about it. A teacher says something. Um, it's like telling a joke, and you don't get the joke. And so everyone else is laughing, but you're not laughing. And then they tell another joke based on that joke. And over time, that compounds. It's like a snowball um, or like an island. And this is really how knowledge works. Um, and this is like really strange, but we have denigrated knowledge and facts. And this sounds really weird. Like we shouldn't, you know, drill and kill and memorizing. That's terrible. That's actually not how our brains work. You can think of it like a machine learn learning algorithm. And um, there's a great book, Jeff Hawkins on intelligence, which essentially says the neocortex is just making predictions. In order to make predictions, you need intellectual capital. Um, you can think of like every word you use, every, every word you learn, every fact you learn, those are Velcro hooks. And so then, you know, as your knowledge increases, the island increases, the perimeter uh, of potential kind of docks also increases. It's like a snowball. You know, you pack it together, you roll it down the hill, it gets larger and larger. There's a great biography about Warren Buffett that describes this. This is compound interest. Um, so if you don't address that piece, it's incredibly problematic. And this is what's happening uh, in all schools. This is why a student can be graduated from a public high school and be functionally illiterate because of that knowledge gap. And so that's, that's really key to Dexter is let's, okay, let's do diagnostics. Let's make sure that at this year, they're, this, they're at, they're at a, a solid baseline. So they actually can get the jokes. They can actually kind of, kind of engage in what's taking place in this course. Um, because if you don't have that, you get these massive gaps that compound over time. This is why Einstein said compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Um, and this is why we have this you know, tale of two cities where there's the haves and the have nots. And our social systems are feeling the pressure of this. You know, the whole promise of school is that it should introduce social mobility, where in reality, it's actually reinforcing existing social class structure. And it's precisely because of what you're talking about. Um, and so diagnostic is a super important point. So let's make sure you're actually in the right class. Sounds right. weird. <laughs> and so is there a flip side to that? I mean, like, because I, I remember, um, you know, you talk about socioeconomics and, and also just like you know, where your starting point is. I remember uh, this guy was reading to me, you know, we read through The Hobbit when I was like seven, eight, you know, or whatever. And, you know, there's a lot of big words in The Hobbit. Every time we got to a big word, he's, you know, oh, apothecary. Uh, do, what do you think that word means? And I'm like, I don't know. So then we talk about what apothecary is. Um, or a lot of times you can guess, you can, you know, from the context, you can be like, does that mean that he is angry? And you're like, yes, uh, infuriated is another word for angry. And so, yeah, you're kind of that wasn't taught to me in school until much later. I mean, I remember it wasn't until like sixth or seventh grade that I learned, that, you know, that they had the word apothecary in a book that I was supposed to write a sentence about, you know, my my vocab book. And I'm just like. You know, and so that class, English, for whatever reason, I'm ahead because I, you know, I got read The Hobbit and Harry Potter and a thousand other books when I was 
really young. So, I mean, do you kind of account for that in your diagnostics where you say like, oh, you're ahead in this. Let's match you up to where you should be. So that way I'm not sitting there being like, you know, oh, here I am in, uh, you know, fourth grade or whatever. And I'm reading chapter books and all my all my friends are reading, you know, six page books about, you know, Sally and Jane. Of course, stage, not age. And that's also the benefit of, of building a, a really solid technical infrastructure around your school system is that you can allow for that. You know, so right now we kind of have this one size fits all where it's, it's very difficult to put a student into different grade level courses. Uh, whereas we need a, a, a school system much more like university where fundamentally it's, it's operating around atomic courses. So as a freshman, if you're at a different level for a specific course, you can definitely take the different course. Now it's problematic like, oh, I've accelerated you to the sixth grade when you should be in the fourth or fifth. That's usually not in practice what happens uh, cognitively with the student. Um, a lot of really gifted students, say in mathematics, will also have deficits in other areas. And so you actually have to kind of design around this kind of atomic progress. Uh, it's super important that what you're describing, and uh, I would definitely recommend any parent that's, you know, has a young child, read to them like crazy. Vocabulary acquisition, phonics is the name of the game. And you can imagine a, a, a child that comes from a, a single parent household who's working all the time, the amount of language spoken to them is significantly less. And again, this compounds over time. So like you, you were lucky enough when you went to school for the first time, you had on this big Velcro vest. And so when I started throwing stuff at you, it stuck. Whereas another student that didn't have that father or that mother that read to them, that helped them develop language acquisition, um, that gave them the ability to read and decode, um, they had a really small piece of Velcro and none of it stuck. And so like, in terms of practical advice for, for parents with young, young, young children, um, I think probably there's three things you need to do. One is to read to them a lot, uh, specifically like core knowledge information too. Like, facts and ideas and geography and what have you, uh, of, you know, fiction, reading, reading, reading. Like that's super important. Vocabulary, language. Um, language is incredibly important. You know, Terrence McKenna said reality is made of language. You know, so I can say that, you know, subatomic particles are made of quarks and gluons, or there's a little, you know, witch with a, on a broom. Either description is still just language. It's language. So language is unbelievably important. Make sure your child can read, they learn new words, they can speak, like language is unbelievably important. Um, and then there's some other things around like physicality, so make sure they're not like physically awkward. So rough house with them, it's another kind of important deficit. Um, and then of course, basic numeracy. Um, but what you described is exactly right. And the unfortunate fact is that a lot of students don't get that at home, you know, because they themselves went through a school system that had these problems, these kind of systemic problems. And so it kind of creates this really terrible reinforcing cycle. Um, and so the question is, how do we break it? And that was the promise, that was the intention of our school system. It was actually supposed to break that. Um, and that is not what ended up happening um, because of how kind of rigid these structures are. So when a student comes into Dexter, they get, we do diagnostics, we place them into the proper courses, uh, stage, not age. Um, and then the courses, you know, this is another kind of key thing with, with education. Um, and this is why it's so important to, to own the whole stack across a long period of time. You know, our current government school system it's so weird, it's, it's hyper-centralized because it's you know, this government monopoly, but in practice, it's incredibly fragmented. This is the weird thing, you know, there's not this monolithic education system and all the kids follow the same curriculum and it's this very clean, you're on the same database. No, in fact- Here is the textbook, yeah, it's like, right? It's, 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 <laughs> the total, it's the total opposite. Um, it's actually this kind of army of artisans. You know, I saw that Ken Robinson, uh, TED talk about the factory education model. That's baloney. We, we only be so lucky to have a factory education model that brings in raw material, reliably transforms it. You know, the modern day factory is a, 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 a true marvel. In, in practice, what we have is this army of artisans. And so you have this higher variability of experience based on the geography you happen to go to. And so what that means is that there's hyper fragmentation in a school district, in a, in a school, in a grade level, and so there's no clear, there's no clear path, there's no clear kind of uh, conceptual model of, okay, you know, how do we transition a first grader to a second grader to a third grader? Because the education, the, the approach should actually change over time. You know, in those first elementary years, it actually should be a lot of direct instruction, memorization, drill and kill, like developing those, the language, the vocabulary, the, it's essentially like the training set for your machine learning algorithm. Like that's what you should do in those early years. Like you should know about the solar system and you should know about like, you know, key dates in American history and you, like you should know the classics and you should know the jokes. Like you should be able to become culturally literate. It's actually about downloading information at that stage. 
And then it should transition into kind of the buzzwords around inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, because you have the intellectual capital, now what are you gonna do with it? And this speaks to this big engagement drop-off. Usually around middle school, kids stop becoming engaged because they did such a poor job at that kind of download of information in the early years, they keep doing it throughout the entire time. And it's like, by the time you're you know, 12, 13, you're ready to start doing, <laughs> you're ready to start actually, okay, let me apply this knowledge. I know all this stuff. Like, let me, let me actually like, run the algorithm. Let me do something with this. So that's another real benefit of a, a, you know, a private school system um, can actually, in a weird way, be a little bit more centralized. And you can imagine we have millions of students that actually can uh, deliver on the promise of what you think happens in a government school, where there's this kind of clear sequence where it's much, much more coherent. You have a very clear, identi you clear identified what's the core knowledge that our students need. Um, how do we transition them to a little bit more active learning? And by the time you're in high school, you should be a practitioner. You should have certifications. You should be programming. You should be building things. You should be an actual doer. And that's what we need to then put you into society to actually become a builder. Um, so again, that's a cool benefit of, of Dex and what we're building is that it's full stack. And so we can, you know, as designers, we can actually design the full experience all the way through. Um, and there's some, a bunch of cool stuff we're doing with that, obviously, because it's all happening in our software system. Um, so we get a lot of data. So imagine if we had every word, Jesse, that you wrote through eight years old to 18. Uh, Imagine that, like, well, and, and, and you, you would, you know, you'd have the ability to analyze it. You'd find, you know, like, you'd use sentiment analysis on it. You might find, like, you know, he's happy or depressed or, um, and then you can match that if you're on our physical spaces of who you're spending your time with. Like, there's just a lot of amazing things you can do, which is not happening now because of the fragmentation. You know, if you ask an individual school district, they're using, like, hundreds of pieces of software. And so everything is incredibly siloed. And one of the promises of a public education is that it creates a shared mental framework. You know, it's like, oh, well, if, you know, we'd, we'd send all the kids to private school, then everyone's like, we need civics and we need everyone to be on the same page or else our society's going to fragment. That's precisely what's happening now. Right. Well, I mean, I love this idea of the, uh, well, I, mean, I don't love the idea, but I love the, the, uh, con condensation of the idea of this army of artisans. It would kind of be like if Ford, instead of having a bunch of factories where they were producing cars, they were just like, okay, every town in America, we're going to be hiring about 50 to 60, maybe more if there's a bigger town, and you all are going to be making Ford F-150s and Fiestas, and uh, you know, you're going to be getting a mishmash of, of materials and uh, some of you are going to be able to produce really nice cars and other in, you know, there would just be some towns where there'd just be a bunch of clunkers <laughs> rolling out the door every day. And, you know, the throughput and the, the quality would not be there. Right. I mean, the the. I, I love this idea because you're right. We think we tend to associate schools with being these factories for children, but you're absolutely right. If you look at a factory, it, it looks nothing like a school in any way. It, 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 you kind of imagine like a bunch of Romans trying to like make their own like, we have made the Fordeth company and they're like, all throughout the land, we shall be making chariots. And you're just like, yeah, in Gaul, they're not going to make the best chariots. Like, I think that everyone would kind of know that um, you're it's not it's not going to be the same everywhere. And and you're right. And I haven't even thought of it that way. So I think one. So what you've 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 your intuition has, has got you to like we can be maybe more precise and specific. What, what are these artists actually doing? Um, a really important part of education is uh, in the technical literature. It's called direct instruction. And what this means is that, hey, a teacher that that gives you instruction, that gets up in the front of the room and instructs, is really important. That's the guy tightening the bolts on your car. <laughs> if, if you don't have a good person doing that job, and that's, again, where the army of artisans, sometimes you'd run across a good teacher. And you everyone knows who that good teacher is. They're just like, oh, everyone just thinks that they're the best teacher in the school. And they are. And the, the scary part is they're just tightening on the wheels. Like, that's just their job. Like, someone else is doing the steering wheel. Like, you're just lucky, and and maybe you get that teacher, maybe you don't. And you're just like, oh, I guess I'm not going to have the tightest wheels. I guess my wheels might fall off. So the question is, how do we avoid that? And the, and the way we always, like, this is our kind of phrase we say all the time. 
we need to reduce the variability of experience based on the human, based on your geography. So right now, depending on where you live, your variability of experience is exceptionally high. And maybe a good analogy is, you know, imagine, uh, what's, what's the last movie you guys saw in theaters? I know you probably haven't because COVID, but what's the last movie you saw? I don't watch movies in theaters <laughs> much in general. I, know, I right? don't know. I I can't even remember. We'll, 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 go, with, we'll go with Iron Man as a, as, a, as a helpful. Okay, you know, so imagine you went to see Iron Man in theaters. It's the best production facility, Robert Downey Jr. They put all these resources into providing an incredible experience. And so the depending on where you live, the variability, variability of experience was super low. Almost everybody had the same awesome experience, and that's by design. Now imagine if the current state of affairs in public education happened, which is that it's this army of artisans. So then instead of seeing Robert Downey Jr. on the screen, the local theater performed it. That would work in, that would be great in New York and you know, San Francisco and Boston, like it'd be awesome. But where I live, okay, it would be horrible. <laughs> It would like the special effects would be terrible. I would have a really bad experience. I'm just showing up. Yeah, <laughs> that's a perfect example. Yeah, because yeah, I I was um, you know, my girlfriend uh, loves Disney, so we were watching the like how they made Frozen two, and you know you have the army of people and they're the best in their field. They're hired by Disney, you know, and even they are, they are having trouble, you know, producing this beautiful, amazing film. And then you watch it at the end and you're like, wow, that was pretty good. And then you kind of go on with your life. But yeah, if you had to, again, <laughs> it's exactly like having the local theater department put it on. You might be lucky. You might have a really good director. You might have a couple of good standout actors, but maybe the set isn't that good. Maybe the special effects aren't that good. Maybe there's one lead who just can't sing and it just ruins it for you. You're just like, wow, <laughs> Olaf, he could not sing in that movie you know, or that play. You'd just be like, geesh. So here's the question. Okay, direct instruction matters. Really good instructors matters. Teachers matter. We know there's really effective teachers. You know, so like in our school district, there was uh, recently this one teacher was awarded an award because uh, she's an algebra teacher and her students performed exceptionally well compared to the others. So the question is, how do we scale that? How do we provide really solid direct instructors from the best teachers, provide that to every student irrespective of where you live? Shocker, technology. There's a great French, French philosopher, Jacques Salou, he said, there are no political solutions, only technological. The rest is propaganda. And so, you know, you might hear, oh, we just need to, we need to, like, put more money into the system. And then that would improve the, the, the quality of the, the Iron Man performance. Um, no, let's build technical infrastructure that allows us to scale really high quality direct instruction. And that's precisely what we've done. So we've built, um, and, and a lot of educators will say, well, you know, maybe we should make like Khan Academy like videos. Well, that's really not the same as a really incredible direct instruction. Because part of the, the beauty of direct instruction is that that educator um, can read the room that can understand, you know, just like any good order, can, uh, they can read the faces and they'll modulate their voice, they'll change their approach uh, on the fly because they have deep domain expertise. You know, they're not just ahead of the students. They're an expert, they're a practitioner, so they can effectively do that. Um, Khan Academy videos are dead. They're this dead content. That's not, that's not how you scale effective direct instruction because th those are just videos. Those are, that's not the same experience we're talking about. Um, and so last year we started experimenting with this precise question in mind. How do we scale really high quality direct instruction? You know, because on our campus we have a bunch of engineers and scientists and mathematicians and our kids get a great experience. But if we're going to scale Dexter, we have to solve this problem. And so we built a really powerful piece of technology uh, called interactive live streaming. And so you can imagine uh, combining something like Twitch uh, with something like Kahoot. And so now we built this technical infrastructure that allows the world's best instructors to provide direct instruction to students. And so the, student, the teachers log in, the, the kids pull up their screen, and the teachers are teaching through interactive live streams. The kids have moderated chat. The teacher can ask uh, quiz questions. And what's really incredible that I found, so I'm, I stream as well, and we have some, uh, some of our former teachers that are streaming now, and they've actually found it to be more effective than classroom instruction. Because for a student, it's actually a little bit more natural to have a Twitch-like experience than to be sitting with a bunch of their peers in this kind of artificial environment. Um, so speaking of the knowledge gap, it's also a little bit more equitable. You know, because there's moderated chat, this, it just lights up with questions and comments. Um, we had a poet laureate uh, teaching a, a poetry class, and she mentioned the word widow. And one of our students in the chat said, what's a widow? That question never would have been answered 
in the classroom. So, I mean, I, I want to get back to this Khan Academy is a dead video thing. Right, because, I mean, many teachers will say, hey, we're, we've got it now. We're flipping the classroom <laughs> and everyone watch the Khan Academy video. Right. And I mean, I remember in school, I I relied on Khan Academy because the instruction I was getting, I couldn't play it back. Like, it, it's one thing to be like, you know, oh, did I have a good teacher? But for me, it was like, I don't remember half the things and I'm a terrible note taker. So just being able to, you know, Sal Khan says like, so now we're going to take the polynomial denominator. And I'm like, I'm going to be like, oh, what? So I go back and yeah, take the polynomial denominator. I'm still not go back for 10 seconds. OK, so now we're going to take the you know square root of the inverse. And I'm like, oh, OK, it wasn't perfect. It was better than my teacher who essentially wasn't with me at, at my house. Um, I couldn't ask them a question and I couldn't ask Sal Khan a question either. It was just sort of I would just have to keep watching it again and hoped it stuck you know, the, the eighth time I watched through him doing the exact same problem. Um, so and so then you you get to this thing, which is a lot like Twitch and Twitch is this really engaging platform. I don't know if many of our audience uh, knows of it. It's kind of like YouTube. It's live all you know, it's you're, if you're a Twitch streamer, you're live and you're usually playing a video game. I don't know why that is. I don't know why people don't like playing their own video games. Although I fall into this category where I like watching people play video games. It's probably because I'm not very good at it. Um, and there's chat. And so tw you'll hear Twitch streamers be like, oh, chat's doing whatever. Chat is everyone who's watching them is able to comment on, on whatever they're seeing. So if they're like, there's a guy behind you, they'll be like, oh, what's chat saying? Oh, there's a guy behind me? Okay, oh, so, no. so let me try and get this then because I've heard a lot of parents in the last few weeks even yeah. talking about how Zoom education for their kids isn't working, that their kids are zoning out and that like, this isn't what I signed up for. This is not education. Um, but I think a lot of people watching now might be like, whoa, dude, this guy right. just basically said Zoom education. Right. But what, I what? don't think you're saying that. Right. So can you like, for, for people who don't know what Twitch is, yeah, can you kind of explain like, how does it look different? Yeah, so Zoom is a horrible medium to provide direct instruction. Zoom's a good medium to have small group instruction and tutoring. You know, so we use Zoom actually at Dexter for tutoring sessions where you want to have really high bandwidth communication with one, two, three students. It's really good for that. To deliver instruction through Zoom is a really suboptimal situation. Because um, again, imagine on Twitch if everyone had their camera turned on. That's not the point. You're there to receive the information. And so in our Dexter streams, it's much more like Twitch. And we have these insanely awesome streamers. You know, so we have true celebrity educators. Um, we have, we've had Dr. Aubrey de Grey on uh, for, a, for a future studies course. We have a Cambridge trained mathematician, Dr. Gordon Hamilton, who teaches our kid graph theory and mathematics. Uh, we have a physicist from Ohio State who teaches STEM coding, teaches physics with JavaScript programming, um, Dr. Chris Orbain. Uh, we have Athena Brensberger, a super famous Instagrammer who teaches astronomy to our kids. And so we have these incredibly engaging personalities who are deep domain experts. And so comparing that to some random teacher on Zoom, it, they can't even hold a flame to them. The other thing is that because we have such a large audience on our live streams, we can put much more production quality into it and we can be much more creative. And so we're doing really fun hands-on experiments. We're, again, using best practices of cognitive science for things like, you know, we use the point of view camera. Turns out, in terms of demonstrations, um, it's much better to see directly from the point of view of the instructor. And so what this means is that every kid gets a front row seat, which is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And of course, we have things like interactive quiz questions so we can poll the audience. Um, the interactive chat's super important. And then as soon as the, uh, the live stream's over, it gets recorded, and so you can view it on demand, just like a Khan Academy video. And so again, comparing our interactive live streams is like the proper Iron Man movie versus watching it on the Zoom, which is from the local theater. And so again, People are the variable. Really great instructors that are deep domain experts, they can do go down rabbit holes. You know, so I've taught a 3D printing class and a physics class, and that's my passion. I love that. And so we can, it's a very fluid, dynamic experience. Um, and the other kind of cool thing about interactive live streams compared to, say, a Khan Academy video is that there's something uniquely powerful about the felt presence of immediate experience, about live interactions. For whatever reasons, we as humans love social connections here in the present moment. And for students to be with their friends, with the instructor, live in that moment, like 
here and now. Like, it's, you know, like, yeah, you can watch the video afterwards, and that's, that's great. But it's never, it's, it'll never compare to being, you know, it's like Ram Dass, like, be here now. Like, that felt presence of immediate experience is so powerful. And so we've seen in terms of engagement, um, it's just off the charts. We're having, you know, like, even we've had some, some parents email us, you know, oh, my gosh, my six-year-old was on a Dexter stream, and it was so engaging. And, you know, again, Zoom is, was designed for video conferencing. Dexter was designed for education and direct instruction, built by educators. They had worked in a school for the past three years. And so the design considerations are super important. We actually had to build our own medium. Um, and then the other kind of cool thing is, it's not just about the direct instruction. You then have to build up a large community around it. And so for each live stream, there's community forums. So there's this community aspect. So if kids are posting their projects. Um, it's like, and then there's, you know, they're getting help from each other. So it's like stack overflow. You know, so it's not just about that atomic lecture, that atomic direct instruction. It's also about the community you build up around it, the meaning you build up around it. Um, and so, yeah, comparing that to a Zoom class, Zoom is not the future of education. Now, you had talked to me, or uh, we had have a conversation a while ago where you were talking about what is put on the average teacher nowadays. And I just found that really fascinating. Could you just kind of talk to that for a second? Because I think a lot of teachers who are watching now are like, hey, it's not my fault. I'm doing the best thing I can. That's the thing. You know, we, I've worked with so many teachers. We worked with uh, a lot of school districts. Teachers are incredibly amazing. And the, like, what we're currently trying to do uh, in our school systems is we're asking them to do way too many jobs. And so one of the core beliefs we have at Dexter is that a transformational education should be radically accessible and affordable. You know, like we really want to create something like the Model T of education. We think that every student should have access to these transformative experiences. And so the question is, how do you do that? Well, what we found is that you have to decouple the role of the educator. You know, and, and as engineers, we just saw that naturally. We saw, okay, there's this monolithic role called a teacher. Well, in practice, we found that those are actually multiple specializations rolled into one. And you know, imagine if you got on an airplane and the, the, the captain also served drinks and designed the plane. You know, it's like, whoa, that would be really hard. Well, what, that, but, that's, but that's what's happening now in schooling. We're asking the teachers to do way too much. We're saying, okay, not only, okay, you have to, you have to come to the classroom, you're a teacher. Here's some standards. Create the curriculum. Okay, that's a huge job. This is why a RAND study found that 95% of teachers use Pinterest and Google to, to grab uh, educational resources. So we're asking teachers to create their own curriculum. That is a whole monster of a job. Okay, not, not only do you have to create the curriculum, you need to now deliver the curriculum. So you have to be a really great instructor. Okay, that's hard. Oh, by the way, you also have to supplement that with individualized tutoring and one-to-one -one instruction and small group mentoring. Okay, that's a whole other skill set, a whole other job. Oh, and by the way, one more thing. All those assignments and tasks that you have them do, you know, that are, cor that are correlated with that, that instruction and curriculum, you also have to grade that. Oh, and then by the way, you also need to interact with parents and create transcripts and report cards. And we wonder why the average teacher is so overworked. It's an incredibly difficult job. And they're, they're like the unsung heroes of, of, of America because we're just asking them to do way too much. And so what we found is, hey, we can decouple these roles. The first part's with the instruction. Again, let's find those rock star educators, the very best algebra teacher, and then millions of students can learn from them through direct uh, interactive live streams. So that offloads a massive responsibility. Teachers don't have to create curriculum. They don't have to provide instruction. Our teachers are our learning coaches. And what they do is they provide one-to-one -one and small group tutoring. They get to work with kids, which is what a lot of, like originally why most of them Join the profession. But hang on, hang on. Tutoring is something that you pay for. <laughs> you you pay extra for oh, tutoring. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's, a, it's and... an add-on. <laughs> well, and, and this is this is incredibly problematic. There's a, I, I'd point everyone to um, something called Bloom's Two Sigma Problem. Um, and so Bloom's Two Sigma Problem is some research from Benjamin Bloom. And they looked at a plethora of educational interventions. And they found that just two of them shift educational outcomes by two standard deviations, which is just like completely bananas. What that would mean is like, hey, if we adopt these two interventions, then the worst performing students in the new model will be performing as the best performing students in the old model. Um, what they were, were a mastery-based framework. So what we talked about earlier is that, you know, you actually need to master the topic, make sure you understand it before we move you on. Um, and then more one-to-one -one and small group tutoring. If you can provide students with a lot of you know, individual help, because they'll get stuck on something, and they need to help get unstuck, and the only way to do that is like a really helpful adult. And if you can do those two things, you can drastically improve educational outcomes. And so the key that you need to ask at your, at your child's school is not, what is the student-to-teacher ratio? 
what is the student to quality time with a teacher ratio? So what's really cool is that whenever you decouple that role and you offload the responsibility of creating curriculum and delivering instruction, now you've freed, you know, you've liberated the teacher to work solely on, on small group, one-to-one -one tutoring. And so that's a, a key second part of the stack. And so that's what our learning coaches do. Um, both you know, through interactive live streams, if they're on campus, that happens on campus, um, or on the messaging system. And so we, we essentially built Slack for kids on our platform. So at any time, the students can message their learning coaches or each other, and they get help, and they get unstuck for things. You know, so for like a program exercise, you just send a message like, hey, I'm confused on this. Boom, you address it. But if you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the, a, fluid, a fluid method of interaction, then that question is never going to get asked and it's never going to be addressed. And again, you get in this cycle of compounding deficits. Uh, well, I just, well, just want to stop. You've got to slow down. There's so much amazing <laughs> stuff here. Just, I, just one thing you just said there, which um, I remember as a parent, teachers would say, I have you know, hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays after school. Your right. kid can come to me for help. And it always seemed like, oh, OK, great. That's not how kids work. They don't get like, okay, it's it's three o'clock, I'm done with school. And oh yeah, I had that math question last Monday. Right. I'm gonna go to Mrs. Smith's class and ask. Right. No, whereas what you just said is how a kid works. Oh crap, I'm doing my homework right now. I, uh, I'm, I'm stuck. Right. Boom, 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 boom. That's how they would get unstuck. Right. You wrong. just came up with a system where he could ask his peers. True. Where, whereas we don't even have that. Right, I mean like, I, I remember th all throughout school, like, the, until I got to basically college, there was no email for my teachers that I had access to and I didn't have an email address. So it was like, you know, I'm just stuck here as if it were, you know, the 1100s. And I'm just like, well, there's no way for me to get in touch with <laughs> Professor McGonagall. So I suppose I'll just have to sit here in <laughs> ignorance. Um, and, and the only per people that I would have access to are my parents. And so I would go to my parents. It's like, hey. Can you help teach me long division? And they they know how to do long division from you know nineteen to you know eighty one, and so they're going to start teaching me nineteen eighty one long division when my teacher wants me to do it a completely different way. Oh, we're doing the lattice method, or I think that's for multiplication. I didn't even learn the lattice method, whatever. <laughs> um, but there was no way for me to get in contact with my teacher. So you, just that one thing. Yes. I mean, just that one thing. Another thing that you just mentioned, which is huge. I remember telling my own kids like, well, go to Khan Academy. The whole unit is there. Right. And I remember them being like, uh, uh, like, yeah, there's no argument, dad. It is there. But uh. whereas what you just said was Khan is a great guy. But if he could have been teaching these individualized classes like you're talking about to the students, if we didn't just see his pen thing like i think a lot more kids would have <laughs> right. been engaged it's just that was all there was that was the only option there was so maybe right. some kids like and he that. started in a closet like right. for his niece or whatever right. like and and it, you know that was like an accidental idea and it was still transformative for the time because there was nothing like that no one was teaching anything on the internet okay uh, to, i mean aside from uh, you know basic stuff I, I have to get to this michael before because i think people are chomping at the bit who are watching this right now if they're like me they're like if if they have kids or nephews and nieces like i have they're like okay crap how do we get in touch with dexter how do we check this out uh, so the the other awesome thing is that because we built this infrastructure um, we provide our interactive live streams for free so any student from we have kids all across the world because it, there's the marginal cost is zero our cost of instructors approach zero as our student population increases. So that's a free resource for humanity. So you can go to Dexter.live and you can get access to these incredible interactive live streams for Shakespeare, SAT writing, uh, for Cold War literature, for computer programming, like all these incredible live streams from the world's best educators. Um, you can access on Dexter.live, which is amazing. I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, you mentioned tutoring used to be an add-on. You know, making that a core part of the experience is really what's powerful at Dexter. And the other thing we realized is that it's not just around content. A key problem to solve, and most parents with a 12-year-old will, will know this, is the motivation and engagement. And so another benefit of a tutor and a human in the loop is that they provide accountability. We used to think that, let's just make a video game and the kids will just go through it. Learning is not a video game. Some of these things are not like, inherently natural for kids to learn, like playing a video game. It would be really nice if we could just make all the content and the kids will just go through it because they earn badges. But you earn a, you earn a badge, you should, you should want to do that. No, some of this stuff is, is really difficult and you need the, the accountability of a human in the loop to actually provide that. And I do want to tell the one final piece of the, of the educational stack is the grading. 
And that's really powerful that we've decoupled that because it turns out really good feedback is incredibly important. And you actually need multiple rounds of feedback usually for a really good assignment. Also puts you in this kind of really powerful growth mindset where you recognize, oh, it's an iterative process. You know, we have to embed our values into our system. And so normally you write a big essay, you get one grade, that's over. Or you, you know, maybe with the video game analogy, you, you play a video game once, you lose, that's it. It's like, this is a terrible video game. I wanna play multiple times. And so we've decoupled that. So we have a grading system where it's essentially a ticketing system. And we have uh, a team of graders all across the world and they log in, they get paid an hourly rate, uh, they have a rubric for the assignment and they get feedback and grade. And because that's their sole focus, they can do so much grading in so little time. And our kids get multiple rounds of feedback on all of their grade, graded assignments. And our learning coaches don't have to do that. The learning coaches can pop in and they, if for big projects, the learning coaches give, give feedback and input, um, but there's a totally different grading system. It's like a ticketing system. It's a, it's a QA system. And so just, just for people who don't like, who aren't software developers, what is a ticketing system? What is a QA system? Like, uh, like what, what do you mean by well, that? Well, think about it. So say you run a big you know, corporation like Zappos or I mean, any, any, any software system where you have all of these inbound requests from thousands of people um, how do you do it? How do you manage that? How do you assign responsibilities? How do you make sure things actually get completed? How do you push that back to the user? Um, you need some type of software system to do that. Um, and so the, the ticketing system that we built, it's a dashboard and they log in and they pop up and they see these atomic tasks uh, for the, the subjects that they're, that they're certified in. Um, they open it, they claim it, they address it. It's either in review or complete. So there's a status on it and their job is to close that ticket. And once they close the ticket, there's usually, this is the other cool thing is that they can comment on the task and the student sees that and they comment back and they have this dialogue because their job, just like a ticket system, is to close the ticket. Let's get it to where you actually complete the assignment as a function of the rubric, uh, this detailed rubric that was assigned. And because that's their only job, they're super efficient at it. Wow. Like I just, <laughs> each of these steps that you're talking about, I can just see teachers across the world going, Oh, wow, that would be amazing if well, I could take that off my plate, for instance, if I'm not like really into having to grade, let's say, because I mean, my wife was a teacher for decades. And I remember at night, you know, we would just be sitting on the couch grading papers. Right. You know? And I and I mean, teachers will solve this problem in the artisan kind of way. They would just hire students or graduate students in college um, to grade papers for them because it's like, OK, well, you get minimum wage uh, to, to grade some papers. You're a graduate student. You're only a couple of years ahead of where these students are. Um, and so then we get our papers graded and we'd come back and it would be like, so why did I get a 65? Like, wh what's up with this? And, you know, like, because this I think is right. I'd go to my teacher and the teacher would be like, well, I don't know, I didn't grade it. And you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> who graded it? Oh, uh, you know, yeah, one of my graduate students. Yeah, I, and I, I think of like my, my electronics class where some of my friends were the TAs that graded those papers. Um, yeah, because there was no formalized system, no proper ticketing system, uh, it was just, it was, it was so ad hoc. It was just shooting from the hip. Um, but it's really cool to see, yeah, it's really cool to see this feedback loop where the students actually, you know, give comments, the graders give comments. Um, that's the other kind of really profound thing about once you open up these channels of communication for their tasks, for their education, the kids transform. You know, so we have 10-year-olds that message their learning coaches to set up office hours. Think about that. A 10-year-old said, uh, hello, I'd, I'd like to set up a meeting. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you couldn't get me to buy <laughs> like a lollipop when I was 10 <laughs> yeah, <years right>. <laughs> <laughs> Like I remember, I remember he'd give me like a $5 bill or whatever and be like, okay, go buy X, Y, and Z. And I'd just be like, <gasps> oh, like human interaction. Oh, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, going into a store. I mean, and yeah, like I never wanted to talk to my teachers or set up office hours and right. stuff like that. So let me just get this grading thing straight. So, I mean, the, the grading that I was used to in my uh, career as a student, uh, I would turn in an assignment I would uh, I would have spent a long time working on it, presumably, or maybe not, hand it in to the, to the teacher. And then some time later, from days to weeks, um, I would I would get back my paper. And I mean, honestly, there is a huge variation between that. Some teachers that I had would have great, you know, papers graded the very next day and I'd be able to see what I did poorly on. Other times it was the next semester. There's disconnect between what the purpose of that whole thing is. It, 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 right. To the student, it's like, whatever, I'm done with that assignment, moving on. Whereas it's supposed to be helpful to you as a student so, to know how to, to relearn stuff you didn't right. learn. So how does it work? So let's say I'm one of your students and you, I, I do an assignment 
presumably. Yeah, we, we call them we call them we call them tasks. Yeah, you you task. Okay, so I do a task. Well, first of all, what does the task look like? Like, is it a is it a sheet of paper that I'm taking a picture of, or scantroning in, or handing to a, a teacher? So it totally depends on the the class. The again, if you're um, you know, if you're in the young readers club or taking a grammar course and you're eight years old, you're gonna have a very different assignment than say, uh, like the, we have an on-shape certification, so a computer-aided engineering course uh, for high school students. Those projects and tasks can be remarkably different. Some of them look fairly traditional. You know, you have to write a paper. Some of them are, you have to build a robot. Like they're totally, you know, like, again, that transition from like book knowledge and core knowledge and then project-based learning. Um, and that was the other, that's part of why we built this system is because we were doing so much hands-on project-based learning is that we had to develop some system to allow for multiple rounds of feedback. So you submit assignment. Um, th this is the other thing is that explicit instruction is super important. Like you need to be very explicit and formalized around like what are the expectations for this project for this task? So you need a rubric. Okay, here are the elements. Make sure, and, and the student actually has to, before they submit it, they actually have to check off each element of the task, which in of itself is a very powerful mental model a checklist. <laughs> Who would have thought? Okay, so have you hit all the requirements of your checklist? Then you make the submission. Um, within a short amount of time, because we have this very formalized system that we can like constantly obsess around efficiency. Um, you can imagine over time, we can start thinking about like auto grading. And that's the thing, uh, auto grading is super problematic for real assignments um, because there's a lot of hands-on projects and artwork and that type of stuff. Um, but over time, we can, we can start uh, increasing the efficiency more and more. To where, you know, right now, like, how, how many students can one grader handle? You know, I can imagine in the future it's, it's several hundred students to one grader. Uh, right now it's closer to 50 students uh, for one grader. You submit your assignment and um, you get feedback. If you reach a certain threshold, usually about 90%, um, we'll consider that closed. You do have the option to resubmit if you really want to get full credit for it. Um, if you don't reach that threshold of mastery, then the ticket is still open. You have your comments and your feedback. They reference the rubric item and you resubmit it. And you keep doing that until wait. you actually master it. <laughs> wait, 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 hang on, hang on. <laughs> uh, practically every assignment that I've ever handed in to a teacher, when I handed it in, that was it, right? There was no resubmitting. Uh, there, were, there were a few times in my a career as a student where I would hand in something and have the opportunity to redo it. There was one math teacher who was particularly difficult and he would allow us to redo tests mainly because he would fail half the class because um, his tests were so difficult. And then we were able to retake them. And I remember thinking at the time like, oh, I don't want to retake the test. Maybe I'll just take the 50. But it was good to have the opportunity to retake it because A, you're, you're actually you're, you're going back and fixing something because in your life, you can't just sort of do something really terribly and then just move on from it. Like you can't, um, I, I don't know, you can't cook a disgusting meal, leave your entire kitchen a mess and then just be like, okay, next day, <laughs> clean kitchen. no. It's still there. You still have that that problem that's unresolved. So what you're saying is basically until I get to a certain threshold, my task remains open. Exactly. Because again, we want to model reality. And in reality, any professional, you even if like it's a very kind of formal project where there's a team lead on it, it's still incredibly iterative. And you're constantly getting input and you're changing. So we have to model that behavior. You know, the other reason, the reason that that's not happening now is not because it's ideal in terms of kind of educational best practices. The reason it's not happening now is because it's a function of the limitation of the education system. You know, like ideally, kids would want to get feedback, and you would want to, like, yeah. But again, the average teacher is just way overworked. It's hard, like even just like grading an essay. Let me tell you, unbelievably hard, <laughs> like exceptionally difficult. Grading the same essay two or three times, like get out of town. That's just it's it's structurally incapable of doing that because of the lack of technical infrastructure. But whenever you develop technical infrastructure, you open up these new possibilities. Using technology here is really exciting me because as the husband of a teacher, I remember Jennifer would develop a lesson plan over years and get hone it and get better and better. And at the height of her of her teaching, I remember her just being so excited because she knew this unit was going to work really well. And it did. And then she retires. 
And, and it's I lost. feel like yeah, that it's gone. Th- right. Like she cannot pass that on to a first year teacher. It will take that new teacher years if, right. if they're good to hone it to the to the level. It's like um, it, it's like all of these ancient technologies that we don't know about anymore, like like uh, like samurai sword making and they would right. fold the steel a thousand times or Damascus. I don't know why steel is such a common one. Damascus steel. Like we still don't know how they made it right. or like the Romans with their concrete. Like we don't know. Like it's stronger than our concrete. And we're like. Dang it. If we only knew how they did it. But what you're talking about here, it sounds like, is that you can iterate and get just like Tesla or SpaceX. You can get better. And then every student after that point gets the benefit. And it's not tied to a one particular person who, if they retire or die or whatever, or, or, or stop feeling like teaching it. It doesn't go away. It's tied to the curriculum itself. It's tied to what you call. So you call it a full stack. And so for non-software people, full stack means what? Um, well, think about us. What, what, what does it take to run a school system? You know, so like any system you have, you can, decomp- you can decompose it into the different elements of that system. So for a school system, uh, part of the stack is the physical infrastructure. So you actually have to have schools. Um, the, another part of the stack is the curriculum. What are the kids actually doing all day? Uh, another part of the stack is the, the staff. Um, that's another element. Another part of the stack is the administration. And so there's these multiple layers of a stack. And ideally, in a properly working system, um, there's very nice vertical integration amongst the stack. Um, what ends up happening, though, in a lot of these older systems is that as you layer more and more systems on the stack, uh, inefficiencies start to emerge. And so and the, the kind of in education right now, because it's so fragmented, a lot of entrepreneurs and education technology companies they will isolate one individual piece of the stack because the school system is a business and there's billions of dollars and you can sell you can sell elements of the stack. But that's problematic because the true problem is not any isolated element of the stack. You know, we can create great curriculum, but if you haven't solved the physical infrastructure part, that's problematic. Or you haven't solved the staffing part, that's problematic. You actually need to hit the whole stack. That's where the magic happens and the complex coordination. The reason why that doesn't happen though is because it's super hard. <laughs> like you would you wouldn't believe how hard it was to build what we built to build the whole stack. So this kind of full stack solution uh, is incredibly hard to build, but you get these emergent benefits that you wouldn't. You get these like these these kind of step function changes in the efficiency of the overall system um, because you you own the full stack. You know, it's it's like Apple for instance. Because Apple builds their hardware, the software is beautiful and incredible. You know, whereas imagine if there's a total mismatch and that and those two different parts of the stack are not talking to each other, it's incredibly problematic. And so this kind of speaks to that 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 need for coherence. Uh, we need like proper network effects. Uh, the other kind of cool thing around, you know, to your point around your wife creating the like this really solid lesson. Um, over time, all of our lessons improve, improve, improve. Of course, we do diagnostic testing, um, but then uh, assessments throughout the term, uh, end of term assessments to really measure efficacy. And so the QA is really interesting. And so these, these, this curriculum is improving over time. It's just like, it's just like Tesla. You know, they're, they're updating the software every single time. Uh, the other interesting thing is, is QA. You know, so one way I've described classrooms right now in the US is that they're individual thiefdoms. And so uh, the average parent has very little transparency into what their kids are actually doing. And you'll find that there's amazing educators out there doing amazing things, but then there's some that are a little bit shady and the door's locked. Quote unquote. Uh, whereas all of our direct instruction, it's live in the public domain and moderated by our own staff. And so there's this constant pressure. It's very much like Wikipedia. You know, you need to, all, if you make an update on Wikipedia, it's going to get flagged if it's incorrect. I remember uh, there was a humanities instructor on Dexter and he made an improper scientific claim around what causes the seasons. Well, a moderator was watching, so immediately messaged that and it was remedied the next day. <laughs> and so that, in terms of QA, but how many of that doesn't happen? You know, it's again, uh, school is incredibly political and we have natural biases as humans. And a lot of times, speaking of the variability of experience, you know, you might think you know what's happening in your, in your child's school, um, but what you think is happening and what's actually happening is, is very different. And, and it's very difficult for you as a parent to get any transparency to what's taking place. One surprising, cra- like the crazy fact, so sorry to interrupt, but the crazy fact is that schools don't have curriculum. They have standards. And then they leave it up to individual teachers to create the curriculum. Well, and I love this idea of there being moderators for the teachers because, you know, the teacher 
uh, you know, one day you'd walk into the classroom and something would be different. They arrange the chairs in a circle and you're like, what's going on? And then the principal walks into the, the classroom and you're like, oh, clearly someone tipped <laughs> off my teacher to that the principal was coming today. And you get this pretty good lesson from a teacher who, who normally wasn't that great. And you're like, oh, wow, this is kind of interesting. The misinformation that a teacher can give you in a room where that teacher is the only adult. And even if students are raising their hand being like, I don't think that's true, the teacher is ultimately the final person who says this is true. And I, grades you on it. it. Right. And I remember I would always ask this teacher, I would always ask this question to my teachers, um, science and social studies teachers. I would ask, if the world stopped spinning and we didn't fly off, would we feel gravity stronger? And my, my, in my head, I was thinking, Yes, because the earth is spinning and there's some force that's trying to throw us off. It wasn't until I got to my high school physics teacher that I got the correct answer. I asked this of pretty much all of my teachers. One of my one of my social studies teachers, he taught about geography and plate tectonics. He said that if the earth stopped spinning, there would be no gravity. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but that never and got I, addressed. Yeah, how many kids? And I yeah. argued with him for as long as I until he said, you know, shut up. We're we're moving on with Mesopotamia. Yeah. Um, I, I and I, and so there's probably some kids that went to my that were in that class, heard me ask that question, and think that if the Earth stopped spinning, that there wouldn't be any gravity, and there was no moderator. Yeah. I was the only person who was like, I don't think that's whoa. I mean, like, first of all, my que that's tangent to my question. You just said something that's super false. Like you didn't say like, oh, there would be less gravity, or like, oh, I don't know, or like gee, this, this question really isn't appropriate for a social studies class. Or I'll look into it. Or like, I'll look into it. It was just like, well, if the earth stops spinning, there would be no gravity. Yeah, gravity is a function of angular momentum. Uh, yeah. So you it's just like, I was like, yeah. And so just the idea that you would have a moderator who could do away with misconceptions because so many people rely on what they learned in school. And so if they had one teacher who taught them one incorrect fact, whether it be relatively small, something that isn't going to affect their lives very much, like if there is no gravity, if the earth stops spinning, um, to more earthy, political, people-y kind of, you know, social studies uh, sort of things, if, if those aren't being fact-checked, someone's going to live their whole life with it, misinformation in their head. I'm, I'm so sad that you didn't have Dexter as a kid. We actually, so... Uh... For the astronomy, yeah, so for the astronomy live stream, I remember uh, there was an episode a few weeks ago um, from Athena Brensberger, who's just this incredible science communicator. And the actual topic of discussion for that live stream was what would happen if the Earth stopped spinning? <laughs> so it was like... <laughs> Damn, I know, I know, I know. So you would have, yeah, you would have lit up there. <laughs> but but you're like, the, the fundamental premise though of, of transparency is super important. You know, like that's the question that gets lost in a lot of, uh, progressive education is kind of a romantic notion of, of education is, you know, we need to teach uh, critical thinking skills and what, and like that ignores cognitive science, you know, like really what matters is like, what are they actually learning? What are the kids actually doing all day? That content question is, is really, really important. And this speaks to this kind of weird paradox where uh, we've, you know, and I, I was, I was guilty of this too. I said, you know, like, look, I have my phone. I can look up anything. Why do I need to know like basic knowledge? Because in terms of how our brain work, you need that intellectual capital. It's actually because we have access to so much knowledge, we actually need to know personally more knowledge. And so in, in most schools across the country, and this, you can look this back to like Teachers College and Columbia University, there's an anti-knowledge bias. It's around, you know, let's, let's kids, like, you know, kids don't need to know that fact or this or that skill. Let's just teach them how to, to fish, first giving them fish. And I, I used to say that too. But then the more cognitive science, the more experience you get, it actually turns out to be the opposite. And so, you know, it's like if you, you know, if you want to teach self, like let's explicitly teach self-esteem, you, you end up with kids with no self-esteem. You want to like have a hyper individualized experience, you end up neglecting individuals. You know, you want to teach critical thinking, let's, 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 let's focus on that, you end up with kids that can't critically think. And so this, these weird paradoxes where, you know, I often say the road to hell is paid with good intention. It would be so much easier with the government school system if we had people with bad intentions. 
you know, if they're, if they're, you know, bad actors, but they're not, they're nice, incredible people. They're friendly. They're competent for the most part. They, they have good intentions, but as scientists, we have to dis disentangle intention with actual output. You know, I often share this story of the Cobra effect, which is this great kind of illustrative story, which I think, you know, we as humans, especially here in, in the United States, we need to be really mindful of unintended consequences. The Cobra effect is that um, there is this village and there's a bunch of Cobras and the government bureaucrats came up with a really sensible solution to the problem. Let's pay people to bring in Cobras. It's just kind of like, you know, first approximation of the problem. Well, what happened? The people started bringing in Cobras, they made money. Well, there is a, now this kind of new incentive, incentive and the, the bureaucrats didn't think through the, you know, the, the net effect of that. People started breeding Cobras. And so they, they gave more and more Cobras and, and sure enough, the government program ran out of money. And so they had to stop paying for Cobras. And what did those people do that bred the Cobras? They let them go back into the wild. And so the actual effect, not the intent, was to make the problem worse. And we need to approach education, we need to approach everything in life, very much like the Hippocratic Oath as, med as medical doctors. First rule, do no harm. Rule number one is a very powerful starting point. Um, and so that's, you know, with Dexter, we've really tried to be mindful of that and really recognize the complexities involved. And again, it kind of goes back to this very weird paradox in life is that a lot of times if A is your aim, you actually need to be working towards B. I, I want to be really cognizant of your time, and I also want to let you get back to the kids so that we are, are educating your, your kids there. But I just wanted to kind of wrap up with uh, this thought that, first of all, if viewers are watching and they want to learn more, that the, basically you do have live um, classroom events that they can uh, audit. So you sh they should go to your website, dexter.school, and, and check out those upcoming events that they can sign up for. I think that's super important. Um, and then I just am curious, you have physical students that were in your school before COVID. I assume that they're now online at the moment. Um, but what are the plans for the future? Yeah, so uh, in the immediate future with COVID, um, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of confusion in most schools around what to do. Um, to us, it's pretty simple. Like We have two different possible scenarios. Either we're on campus or we're not. Uh, we have the technical infrastructure to do remote learning really, really well. Um, if we're on campus in the short term, we'll, of course, do social distancing, temperature checks, I mean, what you'd expect to do. Um, that said, though, with our physical infrastructure, we think physicality is super important. Um, and the ultimate goal with Dexter is to build this global network of community learning spaces, of a global network of schools. And so as a Dexter member, you are a Dexter member. You can hop onto any of those campuses. Because your education is not tied to a specific geographic location, you can move much more fluidly through different schools. Um, this is a really important thing. You know, as a country, we're actually an incredibly mobile population. And so you can imagine like, how delirious it is for a third grader to go to fourth grade into a different state. It's super problematic. So we can have this more uniform system where if you want to travel or if you want to do study abroad, you know, imagine Dexter Shanghai uh, or Dexter in Paris you can go to that campus. So we, we need to build also this physical infrastructure to provide access to the means of production, to the means of learning. In our physical spaces, kids have regular access to 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, you know, VR. Um, the, the, the vision for the physical space, if anyone's really interested, look into Brett Victor, the idea of a scene space, that the, 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 commuter, the computer of the future will not just sit on your desk, it'll actually be a building that you walk inside of. So we can create these, because you know, again, going back to our, our real purpose is to create these transformational experiences for our students. Part of that is you can have incredibly transformational experiences in person. You know, we have to not only develop shared mental frameworks, but we also need shared physical spaces for students to have healthy social interactions, for them to build things together. And architecture is really important. You know, we really have to be mindful of, of the bias. You know, uh, like every artifact has a politic. And so we're very intentional about the physical artifact that we're building to be biased towards community, towards building, towards making. And so our kind of ultimate vision is to have millions of students using our free live streaming platform, hundreds of thousands of students using our full-time program and at home homeschooling program, and then tens of thousands of students using our physical spaces. And we think if we can do that, we can actually deliver on that promise of upgrading the operating system of humankind. I mean, I think, Michael, you brought up a really profound statement to me when we were talking last, which was that um, schools nowadays don't really give kids uh, the feeling that they can do anything. Or we kind of talked about this at the beginning of this mm -hmm. discussion, but I feel like your schools are designed to give people the feeling that they are empowered. And it, it doesn't come from a, you know, like a rah, rah, let's sing happy songs. It just comes from the fundamental nature of reality. We are networked, you know, like in things of the degrees of separation. Like you don't exist as an isolated creature. 
you exist, you're embedded in a system, a system of friends, a systems of community. And so you don't know the limits of that. You know, you don't know because we live in this networked global system, one individual can have cascading effects across the entire system, the entire network. Um, and so it doesn't come from, you know, like a let's feel good about each other, you matter. We're saying you matter because you actually do. And this is kind of terrifying, honestly, because what it means is that, you know, you actually have a responsibility to do something. You have a responsibility to improve who you are because the future, you know, the, the second order effect of that on a global scale is the fate of humanity. And again, it goes back to this kind of perspective, whether it's a scientific perspective or thinking in terms of thermodynamics, this idea of emergent properties. Ultimately, these emergent chaotic systems are made up of individual particles, individual humans. And I think that we need to kind of reevaluate the direction we're headed where we're so focused on these higher order groups, whether they're political or ethnic, and really think back to the fact that, you know, like, I'm a Hispanic male, but God damn it, I'm a human being. I'm an individual, first and foremost. That's, you know, bringing back this Western tradition of the individual. Because to your point, reality is suffering. It's tough. It's hard. The, the border between chaos and order is incredibly thin. Like, we take it for granted that, like, we have all these luxuries and lights, and you can walk into a grocery store, and, like, there's all this food there, and no one's, like, biting each other's heads off. You know, if there's a bunch of chimpanzees, it would be complete and utter chaos. And so the only remedy, as far as I can tell, is to take on the burden of responsibility as an individual. And what's really cool, you know, it's that kind of cliche term of, like, think global, act local. It's true, though. And I think with this obsession lately with DC politics, we're thinking out there. And that seems to be disempowering. And it's important to know what's going on in our global community. But again, this weird paradox. To change out there, you need to change right here. You know, it's like we need to re-bring the focus on who you are, your community, your local sector of the universe. Like, what do you want to do? What do you want to build? Not what do you want to be in the future? What do you want to be right now? You know, who are you? Your highs, your lows, your friends, your associations, your thoughts, they matter. And you know, our media, our culture, they say they, they don't matter because that's in service of some other agenda. We need to revivify the individual, which in a weird way leads to more unity on the second order. And that's the real message here. You matter as an individual. Life takes on a totally different texture whenever you realize that. Wow. Thank you so much, Michael, yeah. for joining us today. I know we're going to have you back if uh, if you'll come back because this. I just want to continue this discussion. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, there's a thousand more things I could talk about. Oh my god, <laughs> this just is... just the idea that like <laughs> you can move and like oh, it's not like who is this Timmy kid? I know. It's like oh, we have all your things right here instead of it just being like here's your report card. Th this is why oh I had so much trouble when people ask me about like what, what's the difference between Dexter. There's so many mind blowing things. Just that thought, like. You want to take your family on an extended vacation or you right. want to whatever, and they can go to school where they're going. Like that makes so much sense. Yeah. Wow. wow. So many decisions are built on just school, school. systems. I and know. you're you're changing all that. It's wow. Wow. Thank you, Michael, thank so, you much. so much. I'm, well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a true pleasure. You guys are amazing. I, I love your channel. And um, yeah, I really, you know, in, encourage all your listeners to kind of act on what we've been talking about. You know, irrespective of Dexter, like you have more agency than you could possibly imagine. And you don't just have to like watch Elon Musk do it. You know, like imagine what would it would life be like if we had a few more thousand Elon Musk like type characters. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Michael. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I want to say now you know, but like I mean, now I, now now, your mind's now we blown. can only begin <laughs> to begin knowing. There we go. Awesome. Wow. I I feel like Thank you so much, Michael. I feel like, yeah. first of all, we have to get you on Joe Rogan. Like, Oh, my we, God. We need you to get... blow his mind yeah. eight ways till Sunday. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yes. Um, and uh, I feel like we need... We need hyper... to get you on Oprah. and on, uh, She's not on <laughs> Ellen. We need to get you on... Uh, oh, my God. That, that's the thing. So here's the thing, though. You know, like, this is another thing in terms of our values at Dexter is that I think there's an overemphasis on mouth noises. And it's great for me to talk about this and, like, what have you, but the real way that we make change is we embed what I'm saying into systems. And we have embedded values in a lot of institutions and systems, but they're old embedded values. 
And so you want to talk about systemic racism? Well, those, that's embedded in existing institutions. And so it's our job not just to make mouth noises, but to actually take on the burden of responsibility to build new systems, and let's embed our values in the systems themselves. Let's not just talk about it, let's actually do it. There's this, way, this big bias of like political activism and talking about it. No, let's actually make it happen. Let's embed those values into the substrate of reality. Um, that's how you change things. That's the, where the real fight's at. It's not on, you know, it's not on just like making great speeches and, and mouth noises. We need to get a little bit biased away from this kind of political grandstanding and be a little bit more silent, because as we speak, there is thousands, millions of people that are doing the good work. And that's where, you know, again, mouth noises are great, but action, building, making, that's what we really need. I, I mean, like as a millennial, I'm, I'm in this stage in my life where I'm like, am I going to have kids or am I just going to never have kids? This actually makes me excited to have kids because it's uh, instead of just being like, well, here you are, dropped you off on this uh, strange planet with uh, no plan and uh, good luck to just be like, here's a thing that 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 like here's a system that might actually push you in the right direction. That's I'm just I'm floored by that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, yeah, I'm, I'm unbelievably positive about the future. Um, I was in the same boat around kids and I was very pessimistic, pessimistic about the future. But after working with so many, so many young humans, I think we're going to be in a good spot. I think these, you know, I think that this, this chaos on one level is harmony at another. Um, it'd be very much like if you stumbled upon childbirth with no concept of what it is. Blood, screaming, you might say, stop, stop, stop. Uh, I think this is just what happens as societies evolve. They become kind of a global system, spaceship Earth. Um, I think this is a beautifully natural process, and I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future of mankind, um, precisely because I work with so many exceptional young kids that, you know, like as an engineer, I, I, I was thinking, like, what are the problems I want to work on? Do I want to do like fusion or life extension or biotech? And then ultimately realize that this is the, the root problem. I can, if, if, I can, if we can solve this as engineers, then we have this army of builders, this army of Elon Musks uh, that can build the future uh, and solve all these big, hairy problems. Oh, wow. I feel, I just feel better <laughs> knowing that you're out there. Oh, this is like God. therapy for you. You can still enroll. So it's funny, like we, we're, we're kind of slowly expanding our, bound, our bounds. And at some point we'll have Dexter University where we have, because again, we have these incredible like aliens essentially that we're creating. They don't want to go to like a normal university. Like they're so far beyond that. We've, we brought the college experience to high school. Um, so they're going to have different expectations for like research labs and what have you. Um, so we'll have very much like MIT research lab in black environments for some university students here in the future. Do, do you know what I love about this conversation? He's a CEO of a company. And just like Elon, not once did you mention money. You're trying to do mm. you're trying to solve a problem like Elon does. And, and Elon doesn't sit there and go, well, we're going to reduce the price of our widgets and make some more profit ratio. You're not talking about that. You're talking about solving a problem, which by its very nature right. is going to lead to a fantastic service or product for right. people. Yeah, it, that's just and that's and that's where like um, I'm very focused on who's steering the ship um, a lot. And that's why like some people don't kind of understand like when I'm like, oh, GM is going to go out of business or GM sucks or Volkswagen sucks and I hate them. And they're just like, why are you making electric cars? And I'm like, I don't like who's steering the ship. They're not going to steer it the right way. They're going to crash into the rocks or they're going to, you know, go do something awful with their ship. And I'm just glad to know that you're steering your ship well thanks for having me and again i think it's on us as millennials i'm about to be 30 you know we're different humans like i grew up with the internet and so i wasn't plagued by had i you know been born 10 20 years earlier i would have been plagued by that by my geography but we have a different perspective we have different mental models we have different language and so it's our responsibility to kind of push the the, the limits of that language and those mental models and take control by taking control by building new systems you know, you don't change systems by obsessing about the old one. You make them obsolete. And that's the, the secret that no one wants to tell you because it's scary for those in power. And ultimately, this, that's what it's about. It's about building new systems. All right. Well, um, yeah, anytime oh. you want to, if you ever come into Massachusetts, you want to stay anywhere or whatever. Like. <laughs> yeah, let's open a school in Massachusetts. For yeah. sure. Boston let, Dexter let us... will for sure happen. Yeah. Oh, Hell yes. Yeah. We're, we're there to help build it. If you ever want to hang out and talk. Um... <laughs> We're, we're always hiring and definitely yeah so if you're if you're a teacher that is, loves working with kids um, the thing with our with our learning coaches and, and teachers is that we we also require you to have 
deep domain expertise. You need to be a practitioner. So you have to be an intersection of really loving to work with students and having deep domain expertise. You know, so if you love literature or mathematics or science or physics, and you love working with kids, um, definitely head to our website and apply to be a learning coach. Um, and then if you're a really world-renowned expert in a specific topic, you're a great science communicator, reach out. We'd love to have you uh, join our live streams. Yes, awesome. I know we have some of those watching right now. <laughs> yeah. So go do that right now. Thank you so much, Michael. I is a Absolute pleasure to have you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Wow. I, like I said in the interview, like I'm just so glad that he's working on that. I feel like he's another Elon. It's like, like it's a weight lifted off yeah. my shoulder. I really want to know everyone's opinion on like I want everyone to try it. I Exactly. I want because you to, like, I know that I could have my own experience. I know that I learn differently than other people, um, which is why education kind of sucked for me. So it would be great to hear other people's experiences. I just think that this is something that we need to do. Like, we can't just keep schooling our children in right. the same way. Well, are we going to keep doing it the same in, you know, the year 2100? Are we going to be like, oh, and back in the 1800s, we figured out schooling forever. Right. Yeah. I'm Pack so glad you're – keep packing up your lunches, kids, you <laughs> don't. <laughs> we have the internet now. Why are we doing this? It's so smart. I know. Full stack – it's, from beginning to end. So Thank exciting. you. Thank you. And I and I really wow. meant that, Michael. Like when you come to Boston, like we're gonna help you build those schools because I just I can't wait. Yeah, with the hammer. Yeah. I'll, whatever. <laughs> Let's go. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Now you now know. You know.